Um, I'll say one, one quick thing. We just recently had an extremely successful Schiller Institute conference, or a Silk Road conference, actually, which was the first of its type outside of China, um, sponsored by the Schiller Institute in Germany, uh, which people can audit. It's on our website. It's on the Schiller Institute website. The point that was made by Helga over and over again, and was recently made by her today and by Laney, is that the way we're going to get out of this crisis and the way we're going to begin to relate to these other nations, which may seem strange or foreign, is by recognizing the best in those nations. China, Confucius, Germany, Schiller. For the Russians, the Russians, the Ruskies, <laughs> Alexander Pushkin holds a very special place, um, not necessarily as a poet of freedom like Schiller did in Germany, but as a conscious political dissenter in the time of a Tsarist regime that he didn't agree with. He was born in 1799. Uh, he was exiled several times, even though he was trained at the Imperial Lyceum, <laughs> which had just been founded by Alexander I. Um, the song that I'm about to sing was composed on one such uh, exile by the Tsar <laughs> in 1825. Um, the poem by Pushkin was composed in 1825. The song was composed by a good friend, Mikhail Glinka, was a friend of Pushkin uh, several years later in 1840. Ironically enough, the poem by Pushkin was dedicated to Alexandra Kern, and the song by Glinka was dedicated to her daughter, Catherine Kern, who Glinka was in the middle of falling in love with. I will sing in Russian. <laughs> oh, we don't have a. Uh, uh. Once again, as Laney said, people should. Uh, I would advise you to read Pushkin <laughs> and to actually go back and read this poem after I go through it. Um, it's called Yapomnio Chudnoi Mignovienie, which can't be translated into English, but it's something like, I remember a magical moment, Mignovienie. Um, and it goes through, from my standpoint, the process of creativity, which is at times a stormy process, and once you make the creative breakthrough, it's a process of elation. Um, there's a lot in the poem, but I'll leave you with that. <coughs> Yes, 
In the course of the first half of the program, we were doing things with a certain kind of theme. Um, of course, there was the theme as such of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the miracle that that was coming out of a time, a dark night of totalitarianism. And there was the theme of Schiller's talking about great moments finding small people. In America, there's an individual by the name of Edgar Poe largely very misunderstood, thought about as being many things that he wasn't. We're now going to hear The Mask of the Red Death. It's going to be done by Dick Ron Tulane, who's an actor of film, television, and classical theater. And I think he'll do his own best job of describing to you, by doing it, who he is. Can you hear me? Yes. What? <laughs> the Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal the redness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness and then profuse bleeding at the pores with dissolution. The scarlet stains upon the body and especially upon the face of the victim were the pest ban which shut him out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men and the whole seizure progress and the termination of the disease were the incidents of half an hour. But the Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court and with these retired to the deep seclusion of one of his castellated abbeys. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the prince's own eccentric yet august taste, 
A strong and lofty wall girdled it in. This wall had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massy hammers and welded the bolts. They resolved to leave means neither of ingress or egress to the sudden impulses of despair or of frenzy from within. The abbey was amply provisioned with such precautions the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. The external world could take care of itself. In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure. There were buffoons. There were improvisatori. There were ballet dancers. There were musicians. There was beauty. There was wine. All these and security were within. Without was the Red Death. It was toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion, and while the pestilence raged most furiously abroad, that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade. But first, let me tell you of the rooms in which it was held. There were seven an imperial suite. In many palaces, however, such suites form a long and straight vista, while the folding doors slide back nearly to the walls on either hand, so that the view of the whole extent is scarcely impeded. Here the case was very different, as might have been expected from the Duke's love of the bizarre. The apartments were so irregularly disposed that the vision embraced but little more than one at a time. There was a sharp turn at every 20 or 30 yards, and at each turn, a novel effect. To the right and to the left, in the middle of each wall, a tall and narrow Gothic window looked out upon a closed corridor which pursued the windings of the suite. These windows were of stained glass, whose color varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber into which it opened. That at the eastern extremity was hung, for example, in blue, and vividly blue were its windows. The second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestries, and here the panes were purple. The third was green throughout, and so were the casements. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange, the fifth with white, the sixth with violet, the seventh apartment was hung, was closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung down all over the ceiling, down the walls, falling in heavy folds upon a carpet of the same material in, and hue. But in this chamber only, the color of the windows failed to correspond with the decoration. The panes here were scarlet a deep blood color. Now, in no one of the seven apartments was there any lamp or candelabrum amid the profusion of golden ornaments that lay scattered to and fro or depended from the roof. There was no light of any kind emanating from lamp or candle within the suite of chambers. But in the corridors which followed the suite, there stood opposite to each window a heavy tripod bearing a brazier of fire that projected its rays through the tinted window and so glaringly illumined the room. And thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances. But in the western or black chamber, the effect of the firelight that streamed in upon the dark hangings through the blood-tinted panes was ghastly in the extreme and produced so wild a look upon the countenances of those who entered that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within its precincts at all. <clears throat> it was in this apartment also that there stood against the western wall a gigantic clock of ebony, 
Its pendulum swung to and fro with a dull, heavy, monotonous clang. And when the minute hand made the circuit of the face and the hour was to be stricken, there came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical, but of so peculiar a note and emphasis that at each lapse of an hour, the musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause momentarily in their performance to hearken to the sound. And thus the waltzers perforce seized their evolutions and there was a brief disconcert of the whole gay company and while the chimes of the clock yet rang, it was observed that the giddiest grew pale and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows as if in confused reverie or meditation. But when the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once prevailed, pr pervaded the, the assembly. The musicians looked at each other and smiled, as if at their own nervousness and folly, and made whispering vows each to the other that the next chiming of the clock should produce in them no similar emotion. And then, after the lapse of 60 minutes, which embraced 3,600 seconds of the time that flies, there came yet another chiming of the clock, and then were the same disconcert and tremulousness and meditation as before. But, in spite of these things, it was a gay and magnificent revel. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar. He had a fine eye for colors and effects. He disregarded the decora of mere fashion. His plans were bold and fiery, and his conceptions glowed with barbaric luster. There are some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not. It was necessary to hear and see and touch him to be sure that he was not. He had directed in great part the movable embellishments of the seven chambers upon the occasion of this great fete, and it was his own guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. Be sure they were grotesque. They were much of glare and glitter and piquancy and phantasm, much of what has been since seen in Hernani. There were arabesque figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. There were delirious fancies such as the madman fashions. There was much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have excited disgust. To and fro in the seven chambers, there stalked, in fact, a multitude of dreams. And these, the dreams, writhed in and out, taking hue from the rooms and causing the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps. And anon there strikes the ebony clock which stands in the hall of velvet, and then for a moment all is still, and all is silent, save the voice of the clock. The dreams are stiff, frozen as they stand, but the echoes of the chime die away. They have endured but an instant, and a light, half-subdued laughter floats after them as they depart. And now again the music swells, and the dreams live and writhe to and fro more merrily than ever, taking hue from the many tinted windows through which stream the rays from the tripod. But to the chamber, which lies most westwardly of the seven, there are now none of the maskers who venture. For the night is waning away, and there flows a ruddier light through the blood-colored panes, and the blackness of the sable drapery appalls. And to him whose foot falls upon the sable carpet, there comes from the near clock of ebony a muffled peal more solemnly emphatic than any which reaches their ears who indulge in the more remote gaieties of the other chambers. But these other apartments are densely crowded. 
and in them beat feverishly the heart of life. And the revel went whirlingly on, until at length there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock. And then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolution of the waltzers were quieted, and there was an uneasy cessation of all things, as before. But now, there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock. Ha, ha, ha. And thus it happened, perhaps, that more of thought crept with more of time into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who reveled. And thus too it happened, perhaps, that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure which had arrested the attention of no single individual before. And the rumor of this new presence having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz or a murmur expressive of disapprobation and surprise, and then finally of terror, of horror, and of disgust. In an assembly such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have excited such sensation. In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited. But the figure in question had outherited Herod and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are chords in the hearts of most, the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion. Even with the utterly lost to whom life and death are equally jests, there are matters of which no jest can be made. The whole company indeed seemed now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of the stranger, neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat. And yet all of this might have been endured, if not approved by the mad revelers around, but the mama had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow with all the features of the face was besprinkled with the scarlet horror. When the eyes of the Prince Prospero fell upon this spectral image, which with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the waltzers, he was seen to be convulsed in the first moment with a strong shudder either of terror or of distaste. But in the next, his brow reddened with a rage. Who dares? He demanded hoarsely of the courtiers who stood near him. Who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. It was in the eastern or blue chamber in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. They rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. It was in the blue room where stood the prince, with a group of pale courtiers by his side. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of this group in the direction of the intruder, who at the moment was also near at hand, and now, with deliberate and stately step, made closer approach to the speaker. But from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the mama had inspired the whole party, there were found none who put forth hand to seize him so that unimpeded he passed within a yard of the prince's person. And while the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the rooms to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly 
with the same solemn and measured step which had distinguished him from the first, through the blue chamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, through the green to the orange, through this again to the white and even thence to the violet. Ere a decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, that the Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. He bore aloft a drawn dagger and had approached in rapid impetuosity with, to within three or four feet of the retreating, retreating figure when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped, gleaming upon the sable carpet, upon which instantly afterwards fell prostrate in death the Prince Prospero. Then, Summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of the revelers at once threw themselves, threw themselves into the black apartment and seizing the mummy, the mama, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in unutterable horror at finding the grave sediments and corpse-like mask which they had handled with so violent a rudeness, untenanted by any tangible form. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revel, and each died in the despairing posture of his fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with the last of the gay, and the faint flames of the tripods expired, and darkness and decay, and the red death held illimitable dominion over all. Mm. <laughs> um. We have a trio, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart from Cosi Fantuti, Michelle Fuchs, Jessica Tremblay, and Frank Mathis, once again, Margaret Greenspan Piano. You want to tell people any about, anything about this? Well, anybody who thinks that classical music is only serious does not know Mozart. Doesn't know Schumann, uh, doesn't know Haydn, but especially does not know Mozart, who is extremely fun. And this little trio is a beautiful little gem. It's a beautiful little pearl in the opera Cosi Fan Tutti. I won't go through the whole opera, but um, basically, you have two young women who are madly in love. And the character that Frank is playing is an older man who is convinced that he can let the two men who they are in love with, he can take them away for a while and bring them back and disguise them and that these two young ladies who are madly in love will fall in love with the opposite person in disguise. Anyway, this trio is um, at the beginning, kind of at the beginning of the opera, where the two young ladies are saying goodbye to their two beloved. They're, the two beloved are taking off um, on a ship. And um, so the two young ladies are singing goodbye to them, and the character that Frank is playing in the background, Don Alfonso, I think, I'm sorry. Um, yes, uh, he, Don Alfonso, is definitely winking an eye at how sad everybody is.
we're going to do, you actually, why don't you just stay in the area? We have, we have just two uh, greetings to the event, so we're going to read them now. Uh, the first is from the Council General of Egypt in New York, Ambassador Ahmed Farouk. It is with pleasure that I send you these simple remarks on behalf of the people of Egypt to celebrate with you all the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. I would have liked to be standing before you to celebrate in person, but knowing about the event uh, only recently, coupled with earlier engagements, made this impossible. However, this event commemorates a milestone occurrence that ushered in a new era of peace and cooperation among the world's nations. The fall of the Berlin Wall did not only unify Germany, but also heralded the concept of the one village world we all now live in. Its effect transcended Germany and was the start of meaningful cooperation between East and West for the benefit of all humanity. Let me recognize as well your great efforts in underscoring the importance of the creation of the new economic forum, the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa nations, that usher in another milestone in history with the formation of a new economic entity that, help raise, that helps raise economic conditions for all the people of its member nations with the goal of enhancing world peace and international prosperity. At last, your gathering, your efforts are much commendable as reflecting on these issues, and they light the way toward the future. Sincerely, Ambassador Ahmed Farouk, Council General of Egypt in New York. Now, now the second uh, greeting uh, uh, will be something that we'll have to make available to all of you, those of you who all have email and so forth. I'm going to read the first part of it and characterize the second part of it, and you'll see why you'll all want to get it. This is from our friend Jacques Bacamaranco. Jacques was the ambassador from Burundi to the United States back in the 1990s and was a co-founder in the Schiller Institute of a, something called the Africa Civil Rights Movement back in 1997. He sent us this message from Guinea, one of the countries that has now become, as you know, infamous for its own version of the Red Death. So he, he sends this. He says, hi, Brother Dennis. Sorry for being late. There were so many delays today, and I missed my rail link at Harlem Metro North Railroad Station as I was coming up to attend this unique event. Well, actually, I have not seen a working train since 2000 when I transferred from Washington to Conakry, Guinea, West Africa. That's a handicap. Since I could not make it, please accept my presentation in absentia. This is to extend a warm greeting to all, friends of mankind, gathered in this great hall of the First Presbyterian Church in New York, organized around the Schiller Institute, uh, and welcome to this well wonderful special Schiller Institute New York City event taking place on this historic day. We all follow in the steps of the great African-American former slave and constitutionalist Frederick Douglass with a new round of applause and honors to the unforgettable poet of freedom, Schiller. Then what he does is he writes a scene, which I will merely do the first part of, and we will send it to you. It's a scene, Macbeth in West Africa, Act One, Scene One. <laughs> Setting, an enormous rainbow spanning between Maritime Guinea and Conakry, the, the capital. A nondescript five-star hotel, codenamed Dorchester Hotel than stage directions. National anthems of Great Britain, France, and the Mono River Union countries, follow, followed by thunder and lightning, enter three witches. The first witch's name is Tony Blair. <laughs> when shall we three meet again to feast on the natural resources abounding in this part of Africa, in thunder, lightning, or in rain? The second witch is George Soros. When the Ebola, when the Ebola hurly burly's done, when the battle's lost and won, and then the vice president of Guinea, Bernard Kuchner, that will be ere the set of sun when hopefully our sacred uh, bio warfare bio warfare scholarship and our collaborative Western government's biotechnology labs launched in, and he gives various names, hmm, and in the vicinities of so forth, 
generating, generate at least one million positive cases of Ebola through the Mono River Union neighborhoods, towns and villages, claiming at least 90% at least of deaths caused directly by our beautiful man-made virus. Tony Blair, where the place for the mapping of this lucrative operation? George Soros, upon the heath right here in Kenema, in Conakry, in Quedecu, in Freetown, and in Machenta. And then Kuchner says, there to meet with Professor Alpha Conde and his retinue of sinister mining investors and mega speculators. Tony Blair, I come, Gray Malkin, God save the queen. Then perhaps in, and it goes on. So you, I, I will send you, as you see, we believe in the idea of poetry as a weapon. And so to conclude our program for today, we have our quartet joined by Scott, or our trio joined by Scott Mooney now, tenor, and they are doing a, the quartet from Ludwig van Beethoven, Mir Isso Wunderbar from Fidelio. You want to say anything? Let it go. Just do it. So this is the um, quartet from the Fidelio opera, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Um, it's one of the most powerful pieces of music uh, ever written and um, very political, which I think is very important. Um, Beethoven wrote the opera uh, about um, the, the, the storyline is about a, a wife freeing a husband who has been imprisoned. Truthfully, it's about uh, Lafayette, who was the general who was here in the United States working with George Washington, who was back in Europe and, if I'm not mistaken, at the time in prison in Germany. Austria, Austria sorry. He was in prison in Austria, and his wife um, was able to free him. And um, this is a scene at the beginning. She has to um, uh, take on the clothes of, the, of a man. She has to take on the work of a, a helper in, in the prison. Um, and there's a little bit of a soap opera that develops around that. But um, the young lady, one young lady falls in love with her. Um, the father of the young lady, the character played by Frank, thinks that this is a wonderful match for her daughter. And then the tenor, is the guy who's definitely losing out right now. Um, he doesn't know what's going on. And anyway, I, I, the point that Mr. LaRouche has always emphasized around this quartet is everybody's in their own world except Leonora. And she is, at the moment, she doesn't even know if her husband is still alive. She doesn't know um, what's going to happen. She doesn't know if she'll be able to see him. And this um, quartet is the three of them discussing their passions and she thinking of how is she going to save her husband.
fällt kein I think that the only thing that need be said here is something that someone once said a long time ago, go thou and do likewise. Uh, it's important to know that everybody that you saw virtually that performed is an organizer. These people every day are out on the street and they're talking to people and strangers and their idea is to recruit them to this as the practice of politics. Uh, we don't really make a lot big deal out of that because in one sense that's always what it has been when it's been practiced classically. Actually, Jose referred to Socrates in this regard. And so we ask you again to go and do likewise. Uh, we hope that you've had a chance to reflect on these great events of the past because that's exactly the strength that will give, be given to you and given to the world so that we can change things for the better now. So again, uh, anybody who hasn't become a member of the Shull Institute, please do so. Anybody that has to see our organizers on other matters, please do so. You know who you are, the organizers who know who you are. And we thank you very much for coming today, and we'll see you next time.